Uh, my name is Aaron Klein. I am the Engineering Abroad Manager. Uh, and with me today, I have two of my colleagues from OIA, uh, the Office of International Affairs, Vinod Rani, who is with our India Gateway in India, as well as Caitlin Witzman, who works for our Global Gateways here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this series, um, we have been holding all throughout the spring semester, where we have been engaging with international scholars, uh, as well as business leaders in areas around STEM. We're very happy today to have with us Dr. Simi Mehta to talk about climate change. Uh, I do want to let you know um, we are going to be recording this lecture. At the end, we are going to have an interactive Q&A, so please submit your questions on Zoom. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please submit any questions throughout this lecture, and my colleague Caitlin um, will be able to queue those questions up and to ask Dr. Mehta at the end of our lecture. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce my colleague Vinod Rani from the India Gateway, who is going to talk to us um, and give us an update about what is happening at the India Gateway. Vinod? Uh, to everyone in Ohio and good evening uh, to those of the state from India. My name is uh, Vinod Rani and I work with the Ohio State University India Gateway Office as an alumni relations specialist. So, so my, in my role, I am um, responsible for uh, engage, alumni engagement uh, from the pool of uh, 600 alumni and uh, Buckeyes in India. And uh, so it is India Gateway, we have uh, been into our 10th year. So we just celebrated our ninth year of India Gateway um, since its establishment. And uh, so the central purpose of India Gateway is the creating and implementing strategic research and academic engagements in India promoting inbound and outbound students and leveraging a thriving alumni network speed across India. So the, we majorly focus in the healthcare domain, engineering and technology and business management. We also work with our partners, just to name a few, it's Tata, Mahindra and uh, Nanavati hospitals, as well as uh, some of the uh, government agencies, uh, as well as US consulates. And uh, so we are uh, working with uh, the hospitals into healthcare and uh, uh, healthcare, healthcare and uh, as well as into sustainability. We did a, a joint conference with the US consulate. And, uh, and uh, we, I, I'd like to thank the Sydney Meta for uh, accepting uh, this opportunity and uh, to present. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. We're very fortunate here at Ohio State to have um, such great colleagues and connections um, throughout the world, but especially in India because of our India Gateway office. Uh, so as I mentioned, our guest uh, of honor today is Dr. Simi Mehta. Uh, she is the CEO and Editorial Director of the Impact and Policy Research Institute, also known as IMPRI. She holds a PhD in American Studies from the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and was a Fulbright Nehru Doctoral Research Fellow here at Ohio State. She represented India in the South Asia Connect program for startup entrepreneurs and next a startup hub at the American Center in New Delhi, and was subsequently chosen for the 50-day pre-incubation program at the center conducted by IC2 Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. Her areas of research include US and India's agricultural and foreign policies, international security studies, sustainable development, climate change, gender justice, urban environment, and food security. She is a regular commentator on these issues in print and electronic media, and has contributed more than two dozen research articles in, re in uh, reputable national and international journals. Dr. Mehta is the author of uh, a book, Lessons in Sustainable Development from Bangladesh and India, which was recently published in 2019. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Simi Mehta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you very much, Vinod. So if, uh, if you permit, may I share your screen? Can I share the screen? Yes, you should be able to see. Do you see? Sure. So good evening, everyone. And uh, while I'm sharing my screen, I take this opportunity to thank all of you. Um, for joining me this evening from India. And uh, uh, I'm really thankful to the uh, Office of International Affairs at uh, uh, and the India Gateway Office of the Ohio State University uh, for having organized this event. I am really honored. So 
if you could just give me a heads up if my screen is visible. Yep, I see it. Great, thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, uh, well, I have been asked to um, talk about my career journey and uh, global experiences, and also then talk about a little bit on uh, sustainability and climate change, which my presentation will be about. So the first half would be uh, my humble career journey, and then second half would be the topic. So with all humility, I would like to take you through my career. Uh, my Early childhood was spent in a state called Jharkhand, which uh, and the place is called Ranchi. And then um, uh, I studied sciences, mathematics, economics, and uh, and uh, I had the sole aim to join the All India Services. Uh, with these uh, thoughts in mind as my career options, I moved to Delhi to um, and enrolled to the most uh, prestigious institution called University of Delhi for an honors in political science. Um, so, well, uh, studying political science right after studying sciences, um, well, I found myself in a fix as to what are these terms called liberalism or Marxism or constructivism or even all those isms, it was really, really difficult. But then it was only a moment or matter of time that I masters, mastered these and um, uh, excelled. And uh, the result was that I you know, topped all the three uh, years of my undergrads, not just at college level, but also at the university level. And with such a sense of, um, uh, sense of academic empowerment, I just couldn't come to terms with the, myself that the three years of undergrad course had just passed by. So I really wanted to study further. And I, with this thought in mind, I uh, entered or I uh, attempted for the toughest, uh, so to say, the toughest entrance exams uh, in, uh, in India uh, for arts and humanities. And I was able to join the very coveted uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. I had developed an interest in international affairs and international politics. And with um, uh, somewhere around close to 200,000 students appearing for this entrance exam from all over the country and even abroad, uh, I secured a rank for uh, a master's degree in politics with specialization in international relations. Uh, from the School of International Studies. So it is often said when you um, when you enter JNU or Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, once you enter the campus, uh, which sprawls over beautiful campus, sprawls over 1000 acres, you leave with a PhD at hand. So this came true for me as well. Um, I appeared for the MPhil and PhD integrated program and um, I got through and I um, uh, was part of the American Studies program at the School of International Studies. So uh, uh, with this, um, I, while I was pursuing my studies, I applied for the Fulbright Nehru Doctoral Research Fellowship and I was awarded the prestigious award. Uh, and what better than pursuing a part of your PhD in the US because um, your PhD topic actually involves US-India collaborations, economic ties broadly and um, agricultural relations in particular. So not only the Fulbright experience would uh, mean to enrich my uh, entire experience, but it would also provide me the uh, opportunity and invaluable experience to study in one of the most prestigious and eminent institutions of the world. Um, the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, uh, Ratan Lal Center for uh, Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at Ohio State University. So, an indication of my good fortune continued, uh, and it meant my supervisors, uh, who have long ties and experiences on working on strengthening US-India collaborations in the field of uh, agriculture. It was a sheer good fortune to work under them, and I'm really uh, grateful. So I had uh, the invitation letters for my Fulbright application from uh, six different universities, but I had selected Ohio State precisely because of the two supervisors, the two professors, Professor David Hansen and Professor Ratan Lal. And I'm sure all of you are aware of the laurels that Professor Ratan Lal has brought 
to us in India and to you at Ohio State and everywhere, wherever he is associated with. So recently he was awarded the World Food Prize in 2020 and also the Padma Shri, which is the fourth highest civilian award uh, provided by the government of India for his uh, achievements in scientific excellence in uh, this year, very recently in 2021. So it was an absolute honor for me to have worked under them. It was under their guidance actually that I started uh, exploring different dimensions of food, uh, agriculture, nutrition, and water security issues, and also implications on climate change. And their teachings on the concept of indivisibility of the sustainability through the, uh, through the integral health, health of soils, plants, animals, ecosystem in general, uh, particularly interested me. And why was this? Because I was present at CMASC in 2015, and it was then that the sustainable development uh, goal era actually began. And um, in fact, I had the, I've had the opportunity to co-author a few journal articles and book chapters along with my professors. Um, and uh, I have continued to engage in, in intellectual discourses since then, since then uh, with both of them. And uh, thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the CMASC team who is present here at my request. Thank you so much. Um, so after returning to India and submission of my PhD dissertation, I began to um, continue or I began with my research entrepreneurship journey and I co-founded IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, a policy think tank uh, for evidence and action-based policy research in thematic areas of uh, uh, social, economic, political, and environmental aspects of development. Uh, as, uh, as Aaron was mentioning, I represented India at um, the South Asia Connect program uh, by the Nexus Startup Hub at the American Center of the United States Embassy here in Delhi. And uh, after that, uh, I was subsequently chosen for the 50 day incubation uh, program at the center. And uh, I have had the opportunity to uh, present my research papers uh, in, in different universities in the US in, and at other places uh, uh, in the world. Uh, as mentioned, I have uh, co-authored a handbook on lessons on sustainable development from India, from Bangladesh and India. And to delve into, so, so sustainability and climate change, as you are seeing, is coming up uh, very much uh, right after I, you know, after I got the opportunity to be at the Ohio State. So um, to build upon these thematic areas, different them thematic areas of uh, sustainability, uh, we actually instituted uh, a special center, uh, IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development and along with seven, seven other uh, dedicated centers. So uh, in this center, what we aim to do is we, or we have organized um, around 50 web policy talks and panel discussions on issues relating to climate and sustainability in both India and around the world in, the, in just the past six months. So we focus more on, on these issues and also uh, conduct appropriate policy research. So with this background, uh, I now would like to begin the second part of my presentation, um, which is the topic sustainability and climate change. So um, I, all of us know, uh, although we might be in denial, some, several of us might be in denial, but what is true is climate change is real and it is happening. And hence, there is the need to adopt mechanisms and practices that would ensure sustainable development. The essence of uh, development lies in uh, meeting the fundamental human needs in ways that they preserve the life, life support systems at present and also take care of the future. So the overriding rationale is the need to reconcile the prevailing and anticipated contradictions between the society and the economy um, and the environment between present and the future. And uh, so with this introduction, um, the focus of my talk would be what sustainability is about and how does um, uh, changing and uh, changing climate actually, it 
impacts hunger poverty and other socio economic distresses so and and also i would lead or end by providing some recommendations for appropriate policy responses on mitigation and adaptation of climate change for supporting the ecological pillar uh, there be, there are other two pillars which i'll be talking subsequently um, for of sustainable development so understanding sustainability uh, sustainable development has been defined uh, since especially since 1987 after the brundtland commission report that uh, it means the development that meets the need of the present without compromising on the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs and uh, this has been accepted by several uh, subsequent uh, international uh, forums and agreements and also treaties and uh, this concept of sustainable development actually permeated throughout the past two decades we have seen especially the uh, 2002 world summit on sustainable development which adopted uh, or which made it clear that sustainable development has clearly become a widely held uh, political and social goal and since then there has been no looking back after the 2015 sustainable development goals were adopted by the united nations so uh, with this background uh, authors have also emphasized upon three dimensions three dimensions to sustainable development the first is the economic dimension which aims to improve say for example um, human welfare uh, through through real income or uh, and also the uh, ecologic di e ecological dimension which seeks to protect the integrity and resilience of ecological systems and also the uh, social dimension which uh, actually focuses on enriching the human relationships individual and group aspirations and also addresses the concerns related to social justice by promoting uh, greater social awareness so while definitions of sustainability varies across sectors but their common theme is to change the way resources are exploited or hazards are managed and these hazards can be natural or anthropogenic um to, so as to avoid the adverse impacts downstream or for the subsequent generations um so how does a changing climate impact hunger poverty and uh, lead to other socio economic distresses so this in this section i would be talking a little bit about um, india india's examples um, so the climate change actually adds to the list of the stressors um, that challenge our ability to achieve the ecological economic and social objectives that define sustainable development so basically all the three pillars we have seen that uh, especially in sub saharan africa and south asia and less for other parts of the world uh, that climate change is impacting agriculture and also agricultural productivity uh, agricultural production productivity and also the um, uh, prices they are all triggered by um, climate change and they significantly affect the poor people and uh, what who are most impacted are the poor communities who are dependent upon the ecosystem based livelihoods and especially in the coastal areas uh, the impacts can be seen as being huge uh, it has been estimated that by 2030 around to 122 million additional people could ex uh, could experience extreme poverty mainly due to higher food prices declining health implying increased inequalities so what does this actually imply upon the sustainable development goals this means that the sdgs are being threatened the very reasons or the very goals towards which all the countries are striving towards to achieve so uh, climate change will not only uh, impact the economic growth or sdg 8 it would also lead as lead to poverty multiplier so it would impact um, our sdg 1 where the poor would become poorer and then it would eventually lead to increased inequalities the sdg 10 um here i would like to point out that the environmental challenges are exacerbating are the exacerbating uh, socio economic challenges uh, like forced migration food insecurity um, lack of employment opportunities limited access to social protection social welfare uh, etc so i would like to draw your attention towards the himalayas the indian subcontinent uh, the himalayas are the world's tallest mountain range uh, 
And uh, as a glaring instance of how climate change is actually uh, amplifying the dangers to uh, life and, and the entire ecosystem. So uh, it is actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if uh, we see the Himalayan region, this one, yeah. So we, we all know that, um, um, that temperatures around the world are increasing and also uh, that in the, in the Himalayan region. If you just see this area, the north, uh, north of uh, the borders, so the temperatures of the Himalayas are increasing rapidly and uh, it is leading to melting of glaciers at a rapid pace. So essentially this is putting the entire ecosystem of the whole subcontinent at greater risk. And uh, um, felling of forests, cutting through the mountain slopes to, and even digging tunnels for uh, making way for building more houses, industries, roads, dams, etc. They are all leading to challenges. And uh, scientists actually estimate that uh, the Himalayan glaciers will recede by around, uh, it will recede at a greater pace uh, and uh, uh, by the year 2100, if you see over here, the, if, if the increase in global temperatures is capped at 1.5 degrees Celsius, and this is an ambitious target which the scientists are saying, and uh, the, rapid, uh, the rapidity with which the uh, glaciers will melt would be far higher if this, uh, this ambitious target of 1.5 degrees Celsius is missed. So basically the vulner vulnerability of uh, specific impacts of climate change will be very, very severe when and where they are felt with stresses from other sources. For instance, the development activities I just spoke about and I'll be speaking more about it. Um, and I will, take, I will take the example, very recent example um, with this map again. Uh, some of you must have watched very recently or even uh, read in the news uh, about a glacier meltdown in the Indian state, North Indian state, which is rounded like this, uh, the North Indian state of Uttarakhand. Uh, very recently in February, first week of February, um, which actually led to losses of lives of over 500 people. And it also led to total destruction of um, hydropower plants, bridges, houses, and a lot of other infrastructure. So the, this disaster actually brought into focus what the local population and the scientists are saying that it is a crisis which is unfolding in the Himalayas. It is just, the, it is just a trailer that they say. And they unequivocally point out towards, um, towards this crisis as being an um, explosive cocktail of climate change and unsustainable infrastructure. Uh, development of uh, aggressive development or uh, of uh, roads, dams, building in the uh, geologically unstable range. Thre it not just threatens the villages, the people, uh, the economies, and even security of eight countries in this greater Hindu Kush Himalayan region. So the countries that will be or that are that stand to be affected are Pakistan. Afghanistan, India, uh, China, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. So the extent of losses are going to be enormous because of climate change. So if we see this, um, in this very state, I would, this particular state of Uttarakhand, it is, this kind of disasters is not new. In fact, very recently, again, in, 20, in the year 2013, this state witnessed um, uh, massive and disastrous flooding, um, 2013 uh, Uttarakhand floods, it is commonly known as, and it led to losses of lives of over 6,000 people. And the causes are very similar of the recent disaster, yet we haven't learned. So, uh, in fact, after this disaster, the India's Supreme Court appointed an expert committee, um, which actually uh, to look into the reasons to the causes for this disaster. And they found that the hydropower dams that are being constructed, that is aggravating the disaster. And they, this committee, this expert committee actually warned against the construction of fragile high altitude areas. Um, so basically this whole area is a fragile 
ecosystem. So the experts have pointed out that authorities are playing with nature more than they should be doing. And we must not go very, very aggressive in building so many plants, power plant, hydropower plants. And uh, the frantic construction, cr some critics have also argued that fr uh, frantic construction of hydropower plants is not for energy security. We should not be blinded by this so-called energy security um, uh, goal, but rather it is for revenue that they are going to bring to the local governments and developers through investments, etc. So this is a very, very short-sighted uh, objective. Um, in contrast, if you see you know, this, this map again, uh, the, the people living in these high altitude areas are, are not very affluent. And uh, what the region actually needs is a lot of schools, health centers, affordable houses, etc. And therefore, with this objective in mind, we need to close these projects, these develop so-called development projects, and we need to rethink where the investments need to be brought about. Uh, Yes. So, well, we have really not taken much um, lessons uh, from these disasters. And uh, after 2013 uh, flood, the disaster, the disaster that struck the state of Uttarakhand, um, we started with building a, a, a highway, which is called uh, the Char Dham Highway. Char Dham Highway, uh, it actually means uh, it connects the four major pilgrimage centers. Uh, uh, for of Hinduism, and uh, this is a 500 mile project, and uh, it is. If you see again, this uh, this whole terrain is very very mountainous, and of course, as it is in the Himalayas. So what we are doing is to build this um, Char Dham Highway. Uh, it is two lane each side. So imagine uh, what we are going to do. Uh, we are widening the narrow and difficult terrains through the mountains up to uh, 10 meters. And the logic that the government and uh, uh, the authorities are giving is that it would bring more pilgrims, tourists, and also eventually economic benefits while allowing the ready access to uh, you know, uh, borders with China. And some of you must be aware of uh, the Indo-China, Indo India-China standoff. So this is for geopolitical benefits as well. So, but what is being ignored is the fact that tree and mountain cutting that is required to build this kind of highway, uh, it would not, it would exacerbate the dangers like landslides. And it definitely would because, and the model of development that is being imposed upon the people of that particular region, it is not going to work. Um, Recently, in uh, in the year 20, 2020, October 2020, uh, the eight countries of uh, the Hindu Kush belt, they met and they signed an agreement to work together for climate action. But uh, uh, this was just, this can be considered to be just an eyewash because in reality, there is some amount of skepticism. Many say that cooperation and data sharing on issues like river flows is being hampered by strategic concerns and geopolitical paranoia. Um, so uh, in, in India's neighbor, neighborhood, if you know, uh, there's a country called Nepal, uh, the former water resources minister, Deepak Gyawali, he had pointed out that in reality, these summits happen and that is fine. Um, media, it gets media attention, etc. But for an average politician of this particular region in the global south, there are too many here to here and uh, sorry, uh, now to now problems that you need to attend to the immediate challenges. And therefore, climate change is just too far away uh, on the horizon to actually matter at policy level. Um, so with, uh, with this understanding, uh, we are also, we, if you are aware that China is actually building, um, building several dams on the eastern side of India's border, especially Arunachal Pradesh, the state of Arunachal Pradesh, which is again a challenge, a point of challenge between the two countries. In fact, the state of Arunachal Pradesh uh, is called as Southern Tibet by the Chinese. 
which actually is a, is part of the sovereign territory of india so this kind of geopolitical concerns and aggressionism is being felt in the side uh, of the world um they have started the chinese have started building a number of uh, in fact nine dams and um, uh, it is adding to the mistrust and that is why one of the reasons that the hindu kush himalayas uh, the summit type of uh, events do not really matter and to that extent mr deepak gyavali's uh, remarks stand true so they they do not actually see any kind of uh, reason that uh, why uh why they should cooperate why i can take some one yeah why the uh, countries should cooperate because from an inter, uh, from an um realistic perspective in the theories of international relations the incentive of cooperation between the countries is going to be very very low especially when you have adversaries like india and china having uh, huge military powers so uh, with this uh, Mm, yeah so uh, having this understanding of uh, of uh, so much of uh, realities the negative realities that are there and we need to have appropriate policy responses on mitigation and adaptation towards climate change for uh, supporting the ecological pillar so it is considered that if we consider if we support the ecological pillar of sustainable development we are uh, naturally going to help or to um, advance the uh, the other two pillars which is the social pillars as well as the uh, uh, economic pillar of sustainable development so some of my recommendations are uh, we all know that uh, the sustainable development goal 13 it calls for climate action and efforts to cope with the impacts of climate action and attempts to promote sustainable development requires uh, uh, requires in fact a, a whole bunch of activities a whole bunch of convergence between governments at all levels local state national and also international uh, level so we need what do we need to we, what do we need to do is uh just give me a moment um yeah so uh what are what are the ways that we we can promote sustainable development some of the ways that we have that i have identified through my research include uh promotion of greater awareness on environmental issues we need to incorporate a uh, lot of activities or we need to incorporate the climate change and uncertainty into measures to reduce the uh, vulnerability to ha to hazards and disasters in order to um, which is actually essential uh, for for being toward uh, or for moving towards sustainable development which actually leads to true sustainability and uh, we need to integrate the disaster risk management into the uh, development interventions uh, the technical and economic aspects of uh, renewable resource management could illustrate the efforts to support sustainable development by in by working with the economy ecology connection so this nexus is very important the economy ecology uh, connection and these are uh, these will be further beneficial if these are next nested within the decision space of other uh, development pressures including poverty so uh, the work towards poverty eradication and all sorts of uh, socio economic and environmental pressures would uh, have collective action um, we all know that many adaptations can be implemented at low costs and uh, uh, comprehensive estimates of uh, these costs and uh, costs and benefits do not really exist um, very very clearly but yes there are some costs and benefits related to adapting to high um, adapting to uh, sea level rises or even changes in the temporal uh, temporal and spatial demand for energy for example heating versus cooling uh, how much is the temperature differences etc but all these needs to be collectively taken at an urgent level urgent basis 
the countries, all the countries should develop a long-term pragmatic and apolitical tract on civilizational survival. So we need to ensure that the civilization survives and therefore um, adverse adversities or sorry, uh, uh, antagonistic feelings between countries for, uh, based on border issues, river, river water sharing issues, all these should be um, pushed back. So we need to have a longer term strategy. So further, we need to have efforts to promote alternative development. And what this alternative development pathways could include, it could include ways and measures to reduce non-renewable energy uh, consumption. For example, shifting the construction of residential and infrastructure in uh, industrial infrastructure to promote, uh, to avoid uh, greater risks uh, and especially in the high risk areas. Uh, we need to have strengthened linkages between government and people. And, the, and consequently, we need to have uh, activities like building, uh, building uh, local level convergences. And these, these, are the, these are some of the key factors for uh, robust progress towards sustainability at the grassroots level. So grassroots level empowerment is very, is very much needed. Further, what is very important and it is coming up in literature and evidence these days is uh, promotion of indigenous and tradition-based knowledge in how communities adapt and mitigate climate change. So uh, this has, uh, or, or respect for indigenous and tradition-based knowledge has been, uh, had been pushed to the back burner. Uh, and in fact, uh, technology had taken over. But now when we know the limitations of technology, uh, we are seeing that indigenous um, knowledge needs to be promoted. Uh, people are calling for it. And uh, this is going to help in adapting or help the communities in adapting to adapting and mitigating uh, climate change. Uh, very recently, what was discovered is that in the southern state of Tamil Nadu, uh, in, in the eighth century, we uh, the kings the kings that they were uh, were ruling in the in the state they belonged to the chola dynasty and they actually engaged with the farmers to develop an interconnected system of check dams canals and natural and human constructed dams to manage the river water efficiently um, and at that time the borders were not very fixed between the states so uh, this was done in accordance with the seasonal river flows and also according to the contours of the land. Um, somewhere it was upstream, somewhere it was downstream. And hence this was quite successful. And measures like this uh, with a genuine understanding of the challenge, um, it would actually help towards the adaptation measures to reduce vulnerabilities and risks by enhancing the adaptive capacity of the communities and also of the economies. Uh, this would be consistent with the sustainability goals. Um, so how do we ensure this kind of uh, traditional knowledge is being fostered? Uh, we need to have participatory processes in research and practice that can foster links with poverty reduction and increased support designed to engage the professionals, the researchers, the governments at local levels in developing countries especially. Uh, then we need to have sustainable natural resource management, which is key to sustained economic growth and poverty reduction. Um, this kind of sustainable natural resource management, it calls for clean energy sources, the nature and pattern of energy, of energy usage, um, agriculture, industry, and trade. It should not unduly impinge upon the ecological health and resilience of, uh, of the ecosystem. And otherwise, if it does impinge, the very basis of uh, economic growth will be shattered. And um, how it will be shattered? It will be shattered through rapid environmental degradation, as we have seen in the case of the state of Uttarakhand. And it would have several other uh, consequent uh, challenges. Uh, developing and employing eco-technologies is very important. What are these eco-technologies? Eco it is based on the integration of traditional and frontier technologies, including biotechnologies, renewable energy sources, and also modern management techniques. 
and these become very critical in um, uh, uh, these are really critical in terms of uh, the principles of economics taking care of uh, gender sensitivity uh, having social social equity and even employment generation uh, with due emphasis which is given to climate change and uh, for for environmentally sustainable economic growth and social progress and therefore which would actually lead to uh, ecological restoration and ecological sustainability we need to have the development policies and these development policies must inform the work of the climate change community um, such that together that they bring the perspectives to uh, bear to formulation and the implementation of integrated approaches uh, and also processes that recognize how persistent poverty and un environmental needs exacerbate the adverse consequences of climate change so uh, these are the few recommendations policy recommendations that uh, i have uh, that would lead to uh, promotion of sustainability and sustainable development and uh, to conclude overall uh, what i understand is that reducing vulnerability to the hazards associated with current and future climate variability and extremes through specific policies and programs individual initiatives participatory planning processes and other community approaches can reduce vulnerability to climate change and in order to go down this integrated and participatory road we need a strong political will which is very very important and a public commitment to promote sustainable development and simultaneously focus on economic growth social progress um, environmental conservation and also uh, adaptation to climate change for this the private and the public sectors need to work together within a framework of identified roles for each of them without impinging upon the roles of either of them and so that um, these perspectives the social economic and uh, ecological perspectives of, of sustainability are built into the process naturally built into the process and uh, lastly uh, the coordination among national development and climate change communities as well as coordination among appropriate national and international institutions is very important and in this perspective all the um, all the unf triple c's um, uh, uh, treaties and agreements and also the summits that are being held is very uh, important and relevant and therefore i would like to conclude by saying that achieve, achieving sustainability is non negotiable and it is the key to a secure future for its citizens the entire ecosystem and also for planet earth thank you very much for your attention Thank you so much, Sumi. We do have some questions for you if you're ready. Um, so one question is, how do you navigate dealing with individuals who don't necessarily believe that climate change is an important issue? Uh, just give me a moment. Sure. Yes. So it is uh, actually a, a tough path to navigate. And perhaps uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, even the international agreements, you know, the international agreements, which are so uh, well objective, uh, they have so many noble objectives, I would rather say, um, that, that they actually fail. So how do we navigate? We need to have conflict, conflict uh, resolution mechanisms into place where, uh, where between the conflicting parties, between parties who are not, not able to understand the challenges that might go long term, that might go against them in the long term, uh, so that these are mitigated, these efforts, um, the positives are brought to the forefront in a more better manner. And uh, while they have something to lose or some negatives that are there in the immediate term, but in the longer term, it would be a win-win for all. So we need to in, uh, ensure that this kind of an understanding is instilled upon them, upon the conflicting parties. And of course, uh, this type of education needs to be um, taught in the, at the school level. 
and so that as they as children grow older and as they become policy makers negotiators etc so they have that sense of responsibility towards their planet and towards their communities um one question from the audience they had said they agree with indigenous knowledge as one of the measures for sustainable development it is exemplified by sorry if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, Rahi Bai Soma, who is a Padam Shri awardee, who has adopted indigenous seed farming, which promoted livelihood as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I believe that uh, this is more of, a, uh, more of a comment rather than a question, but certainly in, this is a case of India itself. And uh, this uh, lady has been given the Padma Shri award uh, for her, for her, dedication and for her work with, and for promoting at, at the grassroots level and there are several several other um, uh, examples of indigenous uh, mechanisms or ind indigenous ways that uh, uh, that the communities the local communities are helping uh, people to adapt but i'll just give you another example um, one example is very recently in in the state of maharashtra um, there was a place which was really stinking and it had a small water body and uh, like around seven, seven, uh, seven years back, uh, it was a very, very bad place. No one would want to go. But uh, having had the experiences and the people, the older people, the elderly of that particular area, they came together and then they discussed that, wait, this place was... Um, this place had visitors from from all around the world the in terms of migratory birds and over 600 you know species of birds used to visit so what happened in like 20 25 30 years so this kind of knowledge was then passed on to the policy makers and what the policy makers did was that they wanted their knowledge to be incorporated and within uh, so if the policy is correct or the policy is supportive of uh, such knowledge uh, what happens is that uh, within within two years time that stinky place it turned to be it it uh, actually brought back the migrant migratory birds uh, to that whole area so if if the policy uh, is in tune with the, the with with the traditional knowledge and the indigenous knowledge uh, because they uh, the elderly population they said that look these are the weeds that are hampering and uh, of course the pop pollution and water pollution etc these are hampering the uh, natural resources development in the area and and it was uh, understood well taken by the policy and even the communities took it in a good light um, and and they implemented it and now the whole area is seeing uh, uh, it is bustling with with uh, birds and natural species great so um let's see in terms of sustainability is there technology abroad that the u.s needs to adopt uh in terms of sustainability well you know uh, this is um, this is a question, very interesting question, because all over, uh, all throughout the time that we have seen is that uh, US is selling its technologies abroad, right? So I, I would rather see it as uh, whichever technology or whichever step forward, which is being taken in the right step or which is being taken in the right direction. Uh, and it is being implemented in that particular area or particular region because what works for the us in in your uh, you know temperate uh, temperatures and your time zones or your uh, the temperatures are different and our temperatures are different the tropics the temperate zone etc so it is difficult to adapt or adopt fully but we can definitely learn from each other. It's not that uh, the global south has to learn from the north or uh, it cannot be vice versa. The whole idea is that the governments and the people must be open to what works and they can similarly emulate the policies, emulate the, uh, the technologies and uh, it can be a win-win for the planet. In fact, we should 
be more concerned about the planet rather than selling off our technologies or you know uh, imposing them upon others another question is how do we ensure participation in light of built and road initiatives carried out across asia and africa by the chinese state how can sustainability be achieved in light of building big and technomage rail discourse okay so i guess it is belt uh, it is about the belt and road initiative of uh, china and it is a massive project which it has undertaken trillions of dollars are being uh, pumped into it and uh, it aims to uh, to connect the land and the sea to as many of as many countries across the world who are accepting this initiative so uh, well as you know america the united states and india both have uh, not joined this uh, bri uh, but um, how do we ensure that there is participation what china is saying or what china is trying to uh, make make the recipient countries understand is that uh, look we are not here to colonize you i mean this is a geopolitical sense that they are trying to build upon the people now we are actually trying to develop you we are trying to ensure that there is vigorous devel development of infrastructure you will have ports you will have roads you will have um, you know accompanying development in the in the area where you are developing and this will be by your participation this is what the chinese have to say well what is the reality uh, observers outside the political outside the scene or uh, neutral observers uh, understand is that uh, they are pumping a lot of dollars a lot of uh, money and um, in fact they are sending their own people to to do all these um, to undertake all these activities the managerial activities or the higher up whatever activities that they are doing so we need to ensure in fact it is the responsibility of the recipient countries the partner countries of bri to ensure that they do not sign on the dotted lines they read through the agreements they read through all the uh, all the fine prints and uh, so that uh, they do not have to lose uh, 30 40 or even 99 years uh, down the line because 99 years lease is what the chinese is chinese are uh, attempting at in these places so uh, and and uh, if if the observers uh, at the at the natural resources level or uh, sustainable sustainability uh, observers i would say if they observe that um, for example if you see the case of uh, pakistan uh, the bri in pakistan is called cpec and uh, in in terms of uh, bringing development to that region it is very close to the indian border and uh, chinese really want that that whole place to be you know, developed so uh, what they are actually doing is in 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 the name of development they are wiping out very very important natural resources they are um, it they are actually doing a lot of uh, um, or bringing a lot of challenge to the whole region of course it is again in the himalayan belt the terrain is difficult it is a seismic zone high earthquake prone zone so it is up to the it should be up to the uh, level of the of the governments or of the countries that uh, they are engaging with that uh, need to be very very aware instead of simply um, simply going for the short term objective of uh, bringing in uh, economic growth for their countries another question so race of development among countries is a deteriorating environment why developing countries are more concerned than developed countries about climate change be it america china it is being observed that their initiatives that they don't want climate change to improve such as america resisting climate agreements china's deteriorating environment what mindset must developed countries possess that they fail to recognize the deterioration um well this is a very interesting question and uh, in fact uh, they should the countries who are 
who are in denial that you know climate change is hoax and uh, we are we are not uh, really going to suffer because in my lifetime climate change is not going to happen so this kind of very selfish uh, sort of uh, understanding should not prevail because uh, climate change says if we you know personify climate change it says it would say that i am coming after you because uh, the rest of the world who are in a troubled zone for example south asia sub saharan africa africa latin america so all these countries would fall first because perhaps because of the challenges that are being provided by the developed north so uh, even if these countries like china us uh, they are they are resilient and uh, in fact one of the good reasons uh, of uh, or good effects of uh, climate change in your own agricultural production in the united states has been that the productivity has increased because it is warmer and then you have a lot of agricultural productivity but going ahead say 30 years down the line this is going to trouble you so we need to have a longer term perspective and we as in not just sitting in us or india or developed north global south wherever we are we need to understand from the perspective of those who are suffering because it's not that just the third person is suffering it will definitely come after us if we are not taking care of uh, these obvious implications 1.5 degree celsius as i mentioned is a very ambitious target Uh, we are we are not sure that we are e- even able to maintain it all this all the countries have their ndcs the nationally determined contributions but um, but are we really going towards it are we going to achieve them in the foreseeable future and if we are not if we are not serious about it uh, the policies the policy makers the governments um, because it is normally seen that the communities are more uh, sensitive to these issues and therefore what is required is that all the countries um, all the countries work in tandem with with the communities with all the stakeholders uh, whether it is in the developed countries or in the developing countries so that their initiatives and whatever they are committing say for example the paris uh, paris agreement or um, in the in the as their ndcs they are actually living to their commitment so they should underline their commitment towards sustainability otherwise we are all up for a big mess thank you so much i don't see any other questions right now so i wanted to give you the opportunity to give any closing thoughts that you have before we wrap up the presentation today uh well you know climate change and sustainability is such a such a complex uh, topic in fact uh, you know in in research as well and if it is only uh, in, if uh, na- if climate change is studied in silos in terms of natural sciences then uh, then it will it will only be a few handful of people who will be understanding the real meaning of climate change once it is uh, told or once it is communicated to the people the larger population in understandable terms and there the so- the social sciences come in come into the picture when it is communicated or conveyed in uh, in uh, in terms of uh, normal understanding not in you know technical jargons etc then people will understand then people will come to know that there is a challenge because every every other year we know that you know the temp- the there is early onset of winters in india for example right in january and february we are seeing that we have to have use fans and air conditioners etc so we are aware that things are changing um we are also aware that uh, in terms of massive floods the uh, the rainy season somewhere it is drought in the country or somewhere there is excess of water so all these things people are understanding and it is the people at the grassroots level who are suffering so if these thoughts are clearly communicated to the policy and vice versa how we are going to fight and in this place i would like to point out the role of the scientific community that 
they have a huge role to play. Normally, the scientific community are um, are into their laboratories and you know research papers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But once they begin to communicate to the people, and once their their opinion are taken by the uh, by the policymakers, it would really yield to a lot of difference. And so, so I would like to end with this: that uh, we are all we are in this uh, together. And uh, whichever place we are in in the world, uh, we we have to have a degree of responsibility, and only then degree of responsibility towards the planet, and only then we can really talk about you know that uh, sustainability without or sustainable development that our development needs should not impinge or infringe upon the needs of the future generations. So otherwise. We should, otherwise we are in for a big challenge. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sumi, for your presentation today and for being here on behalf of all of us at Ohio State. We're so grateful for your time and for being here with us. And thank you to our participants for being here. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, we have one more of this uh, panel series for Buckeye Bridge. I'm sending the registration link in the chat. so. That one will be on April 15th, where our pres presenter will be talking about Internet of Things um, in partnership with our India Gateway. But thank you so much again. Um, we're so grateful for you. Um, thank you to the India Gateway for helping to make this connection. Um, but thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Aaron. And Vinod, thank you so much. Wish you a very good thanks, day. Amy. Thanks, Amy. Thanks.